Hello, hello. Welcome to tea time. I am out here on this beautiful April day with my horses. There's Ari. He's just coming out with me. And out in the field here, we've got Raz and Sassafras. And then Atlas is a little farther out. So I'm just going to find a nice spot to sit for a moment drink a cup of tea and chat with you all. Thank you guys for joining me, whether it's in live real, t real time or if you're joining me on the recording later, either way. I'm thrilled to spend some time with you. So today for tea time, I thought that I would talk about patterns of trust. This is a really interesting question that came up with one of my students this week that I've been pondering and I thought I would share my thoughts with you. So all of us, I think, really want to trust our horses and we want to trust them to make reasonable, good decisions that are for the benefit of everybody in the group. So, you know, I've got Sassafras behind me here. He's coming to join me. I've got Atlas over there, headed his own direction. And then Raz and Ari will probably come over the hill in a minute or two. Trust is an interesting thing. So trust is built from past experiences. So here's Sassafras, he's five, and I can trust that he is going to play. Okay, he's young. So he's very gentle, he's very kind, but in general, he's gonna be a little impatient with me sitting still for too long. So he's gonna start nudging on me. And that's normal, that's very normal for a five-year-old. Now, I can sit here, I could correct him, I could tell him he's wrong or bad, I could wait for him to escalate um, and then do something about it, but instead, I'm gonna go ahead and pass by him. I'm gonna walk through his blind spot and that disconnects us and I'll find some place to sit where I am not gonna be pushed on. I will move as many times as I need to. And why this is interesting is because I trust him to do exactly what he normally does. So that's what trust is. Trust is from past experiences. So Sassafras is not wrong or bad, he's young. And as a youngster, he likes activity. If I don't take action soon enough, he will push me until I take action. And then I either have to punish him for pushing me, which is not my style, or I have to do something about it. If I give him action after he pushes me, I teach him that pushing me is the right way to get the entertainment he wants. Hey Don, it's good to see you here for tea time. So trusting your horse is about trusting them to do what you know they normally do. You're trusting in their habits. So how do we build the kind of habits where we feel like our horse is really trustworthy? And this comes down to decision making. So I can trust Sassafras to be a five-year-old colt and I can trust him to just be who he is and then I can navigate around that. I can trust um, Raz or Atlas or Ari or any one of my horses to be who they are. But how do I develop a relationship where I can trust them to be who I need them to be? And that I think was the core of the question. So I need a horse that is going to think of the well-being of me and them. How do, how do we work so that everybody's well-being is important? And in order to do that, we have to have a set of experiences where my horse makes decisions that are good for both of us. And then I respond to them in a way that marks them as memorable and important to the relationship. When they make decisions that are not good for both of us, 
as you guys saw Sassafras do here, he started to push on me and that really wasn't good for me. So it's really important that I walk past that, I dissociate from it, I, I discourage it simply by not giving it any attention. What you're gonna find is the more times you walk past behavior you don't like, that isn't good for you, the more it starts to become extinct. It won't perpetuate if it doesn't get any attention. Now, if you are late, so if Sassafras pushes on me and then I respond by going to action, that is a form of attention. So the key is actually to get ahead of the stuff that I don't like and then wait for the stuff that I do like, making sure that I mark it with my attention, my presence and my lack of distraction. Now, this, there is a more advanced level to this, and that starts with what I call the interactive practice. So in my work through my online course, which I still have a couple of places open, if anybody wants to join me, I have an 18 week course starting on May 22nd, and there's just a couple of student places open. So if any of you are really interested in delving deep, drop me an email. What I start with is the observational part of training and the observational practice is just noticing how horses interact with each other, noticing what's normal, what are their habits, who can you trust them to be because that's what they practice all the time. Then we build into the responsive practice where we show them we understand them. We know what they're going to do next and we get ahead of the stuff that we don't love and we make sure that we stay present and fully available for the stuff we do love. And that's a responsive practice. Now, when we take it up a notch, we have the interactive practice. And the interactive practice is where we start to impact them a little bit. We do things that might change their choices. So this is where I get into a lot of the touching distance. This is where I get into things like rocking. This is where we start to yield the horse, asking him to back up or turn left or turn right. This interaction will change what they're thinking about. It'll change their patterns and their habits. And when it changes for the better, we're gonna pause and mark it and make it memorable so that that becomes the stronger habit. When we make a mistake and perhaps we interact in a way that makes their behavior something we don't love, then we're gonna go ahead and just keep moving around it, moving past it and figure out ways to change it again. Change is a constant, it's always happening. Now, once we get into this interactive practice, some of the things we do will be more challenging and some of the things we do will be less challenging. And we're gonna do it in a fairly predictable pattern. And what happens is the horse starts to be able to predict when we're gonna do the more challenging exercises. And naturally, all horses will do this. They'll start to make what I call counter offers, where they offer you something you love doing. Ari, as an example, my stallion, he loves taking me for walks. So right before I would normally say, let's try a more challenging exercise, he likes to just make sure that I'm settled in harmony of his neck or his shoulder or his hip. And then when I'm settled and we're in really nice harmony, he'll take off very, very slowly at an easy walk, often in a curve around me. And then he'll get me started and we'll go for a long walk. He'll show me his favorite places in the pasture. He'll show me the things that he likes best. This is a perfect distraction from the more challenging things that I might wanna try. Things like he doesn't love it when I hug his head or he doesn't really love it when I hold up a hoof for too long. We can do it for a long time, but there's a longer amount of time that sort of pushes the edge of his comfort zone. Those are things that I might work on that would be a little challenging for Ari, not for all horses, but for him. When he knows the challenge is coming, he has an opportunity to make very, very good decisions that impact both of us in a positive way. And if he can do that, he distracts me from the hard things. This is how you build patterns and habits of horses making good decisions that benefit both parties. So if hard stuff comes up in life, let's say the neighbor's mares get out and that's very, very challenging and there's chaos and horses running everywhere, this hasn't happened. But if it did, hopefully, Ari, my stallion, 
would make a decision that was good for both him and me. So when life gets hard, the response should be, let's come up with something to do that's good for me and my herd, not just stuff that's good for me. So this is sort of advanced trust building that I do as I get deeper into freedom-based training. And then from the interactive practice, we're gonna get into the insistent practice, we're gonna get into the um, assertive practice. There's all sorts of levels we can build into this, but it's all about building their emotional stability. Now, we can see Sassafras headed in. Before he starts to push on me, I'm gonna go ahead and say hello, it's nice to see you. And then I'm gonna walk past. I'm gonna go ahead and go through his blind spot so he can't see me anymore for a moment. This dis detaches us, gives him an opportunity to think about something else, and then I'll find the spot I wanna be. And what I did is I just changed the pattern of him pushing on me to get action, and I gave him action before he pushed on me. So I gave him what he needed, but I did it at a time that he wasn't pushing on me. This is gonna build a habit and a pattern where he knows if he wants action, he doesn't have to push for it. And we want to build those kinds of patterns with our horses. When stuff isn't quite good enough for them, when they're frustrated, when there's chaos, do they make choices for the good of everybody around them? That makes them more trustworthy. Or do they only make choices for their own benefit? That makes them less trustworthy. Now, as I said in the beginning, you can trust any horse to be who they are and to do what they naturally do. So I trust Sassafras that if I sit still for too long, he's going to come push on me. And as it is, there's that cute guy already thinking about maybe the fact that I've sat still for too long. I'm going to go past his tail, through his blind spot, give him a chance to think about something other than me. And then I'll figure, learn that I can be counted on to do things that he needs without him pushing on me. And this is going to develop a habit and a pattern where I can trust him not only to be himself and to do what he normally does, but to shape what he does so that it's increasingly gentle and cooperative and good for everyone around him. So... I hope that's helpful for you guys. Think about it a little bit with your horses. You can trust them to do what they do normally. The more you practice it, the more you can trust them. The more you practice it in different environments, under different social pressures and environmental pressures, the more you will be able to trust them. So before Sassafras goes ahead and pushes on me, I'm just gonna go past him. I'm gonna go through his blind spot here. I'm gonna dis disengage a little bit. And then we will go ahead and let him go back to what he was doing. It's simple, takes a little bit of repetition, but it's gonna build a new habit where he doesn't need to push on me to get action. He's very new here. And that is so much fun. I don't mind moving a little bit to build the kind of habits I want. Now, do I like him coming up and talking to me? Absolutely. So sometimes he's going to come up, he's going to nuzzle my hair, he's going to say hello, and then I'm going to go ahead past him because I don't want to completely discourage that behavior. I just don't want to stay long enough that he needs to push on me. If I do, if I stay long enough that Sassafras needs to push on me, we start developing a habit and a pattern where that's what I can trust him to do. Is that long-term what I want to trust him to do? No. I want him to come up, greet people, but be very gentle and not push on them. And so that's the kind of behavior that I'm going to try and reinforce. And he'll get more and more trustworthy with it. We'll practice it in different areas with different herds. We'll practice it in different environments with different environmental pressures, with different social pressures until it's just part of who he is. 
And that's how you build the trustworthy partner. There's simple ways of doing it. There's deeper levels of doing it. It's all fascinating in my opinion, but hopefully that gave you some food for thought. And I'm gonna leave you guys there for today. I will be here for tea time next week. I will be headed to Poland. So the time might be a little different. I'll post it on the Facebook page for those of you who are interested in joining me live. Otherwise the replay will always be available later. All right, you guys have a wonderful day and enjoy the beautiful spring weather if you're in the Northwest of the US like me. And I will see you next week.